Now, in this lecture, I'd like to talk about Coulomb's law. Now, in the same way that any two masses will feel a force due to one another, and this force is given by the gravitational law, any two electric charges will also feel a force due to one another, and this force is given by Coulomb's law. Now, only problem is the following. Mass is a tangible concept. You can see mass. You can feel mass. And you can certainly hold mass. Matter is composed of mass, so in many ways, matter is mass. Now, for charge, for electric charge, things aren't that simple. You can't hold charge. You can certainly feel what charge is. If you stick your hand into a socket, you'll definitely feel what charge is. But you can't hold charge, so it becomes a little bit difficult to define exactly what charge is. Now, from experiments, scientists saw that certain subatomic particles, such as electrons, neutrons, and protons, have this innate property. And this property manifests itself uh, in certain ways. And so they decided to define charge in the following way. An electric charge, Q, is an innate property of certain subatomic particles. And they said that one electron has a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, where coulombs is our unit of charge. And likewise, they said one proton has a charge of positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Now, where did this negative and positive come from? Well, the negative and positive came from an arbitrary place. They're completely arbitrary. In other words, this guy could have been negative, and this guy could have been positive. Or this guy could have been up, and this guy could have been down. Or left and right, or black and white. The point is, the negative were chosen to simply represent a manifestation of what charges. In other words, an electron attracts a proton, and a proton attracts an electron. And that's always the case. And because their quantity is the same, the amount of charge is the same, it's just opposite, they decided to give the electron a negative charge and the proton a positive charge. Now, in the same way that we have the conservation of mass, in other words, mass cannot be destroyed or created, mass always exists. And so the amount of mass in our universe is exactly the same. It stays constant. There's also conservation of charge. In other words, the amount of charge in our universe is always constant, always stays the same. And that means charge cannot be destroyed. It cannot be created. It always exists. So the universe has a net charge of zero. And what this means is that the total number of electrons and protons in our universe is exactly the same. They're equal. Because look, they have the same amount of charge, just negative charge. That means if we had different amounts of protons and electrons, <coughs> our universe would have some charge. But since our universe has a charge of zero, that means that number of electrons equals the number of protons. So what can we conclude about this? Well, this means the following. Whenever charge is created, whenever we have a net negative charge or a net positive charge on some object or some atom, that means whenever there is a negative charge created on one atom, there must be a positive charge created on another atom. Likewise, if there is positive charge created on another atom, that means there is a negative charge created on a different atom. Now, <coughs> quantum theory tells us that subatomic particles such as electrons and protons carry quantized or discrete amounts, specific amounts of charge where the smallest amount is 1.6 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs. In other words, this number does not get smaller. This is the smallest possible amount of charge. You can't get any smaller. And if you increase the charge, you increase by increments of this number. So multiply this by 2, by 3, by 4. Multiply that by whole numbers, not by fractions. 
and that's why we say electrons and protons are quantized. Remember what quantum theory also tells us about subatomic, subatomic particles. Subatomic particles are not solid spheres in the same way that we can hold a solid ball. We can't hold a solid ball of electrons because electrons aren't solid. They act as both a wave and a particle. So they're somewhere in between. And that's what we get from quantum theory. So finally, let's look at the crux of the matter. Let's look at our Coulomb's law. Now let's suppose we have the following situation. We have one proton and one neutron. Let's calculate the force with which our electron attracts our proton and the force with which our proton attracts our electron. Now the distance between these two guys, between our proton and electron, is r. Now Coulomb's law gives us this force. So force equals, and notice force is a vector. It has both magnitude and direction. Therefore, we put this line on top of our f to represent the fact that it's not a scalar, it's a vector. So force is equal to k, a constant that we know this constant is 8.988 times 10 to the 9 newtons divided by meter squared times coulomb squared. Now, Q1, so charge of our proton, times Q2, charge of our electron, divided by the distance between them, squared. Now, in here, we're assuming that these guys are point charges. Now, I'll talk more about point charges in a different lecture. But we're making the assumption that they're point charges. So, to calculate our force, we simply plug in the charges of these guys, our constant, and the distance between them. So let's make the assumption that the distance between them is on the atomic scale, so it's very small. Let's say it's 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters, a very, very, very small amount. Now the charges of these guys are the same. Their, ma their magnitudes are the same, but their directions are different. In other words, one is positive, one is negative. The constant stays the same. So I plug these guys into our formula and I get the following. Force equals constant times both charges. Now I'm leaving my negative sign out for now and I'll tell you why in a second. Divided by our distance between them squared. So notice the meters squared cancel. C times C, C squared coulombs also cancel and we're left with newtons. So we get 8.19 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons. So a relatively small amount. Now, so this guy is positive in one direction and negative in a second direction. And that depends on what you choose your negative direction to be and your positive direction to be. Remember, they're vectors. So let's choose our x-axis to be our axis. And let's say that going uh, from our going in this direction is positive and going in this direction is negative, like it is on the xy plane. So that means this force, which is the force due to or the <coughs> the force on our proton due to our electron is going this way. So that means this force, force on this guy due to this guy is 8.19 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons. That means this force, the force having the same magnitude but in different direction, is negative 8.19 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons. In other words, the force on this electron due to our proton is negative of this amount. So that means these forces are always the same but in different directions. Now, this force is also known as electrostatic force. Well, why electrostatic? Well, because electrostatic simply means the force due to a stationary charge. Now, notice that a proton has mass, and so does an electron. And that means we should also take into consideration the force due to gravity when we calculate electrostatic force. But, as it turns out, electrostatic forces are much greater than gravitational forces. And let's see exactly by how much. 
let's calculate the gravitational forces that these two masses experience. And we simply use our formula for the gravitational law. So our force due to gravity is equal to gravitational constant, capital G, which is 6.6 .6 times 10 to negative 11, times mass of our proton, which is 1.6 times 10 to negative 27 kilograms, times the mass of an electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to negative 31 kilograms, divided by our distance between them squared. So, we plug things into the calculator and we find that our answer is 3.61 times 10 to the negative 47 newtons. Negative 47. That is so much smaller than this number that if we take the ratio of these two numbers to see by what amount this is larger than this guy, we plug into the calculator and we see that this force, our electrostatic force, is greater than our gravitational force by 2.27 times 10 to the 39. That's a very, very large number. And therefore, because electrostatic forces are so much larger than our gravitational forces, whenever we calculate our electrostatic forces, forces due to charge, we never take the gravitational force into consideration. We never take their masses into consideration. So whenever we're dealing with uh, the atomic scale, we only look at electrostatic force and not the gravitational force.